Hello everybody. Welcome to the Stats for the Masses webinar. Today we're doing the first of our Back to Basics series, Parameters, Statistics, and Confidence Intervals. My name's Elaine Eisenbeis, and I'm the owner and principal here at Omega Statistics. We do have quite a large number of registrants today. I see many are re-attending with us, so thank you for taking the time of the people that are joining us live. And of course, we're going to record for those who aren't here today. Today, I'm going to present a very brief overview of why we use statistics. I'm also going to give a very simple example of how to determine an average of a population using only a sample of information. Over the past couple of years, I have noticed that many people uh, come to me not really understanding statistics, the why or the how, or they're, they're just, they're lost. So I'm hoping that this will be useful today. We won't get into too much detail. We're just going to focus on the why. Today's just an overview but I hope that the information you receive today will give you some ideas and maybe guide you on the use of statistics in your world. I say this in all of our webinars to use what you learn today, apply it in a holistic way. Try to look past the name of the terms, try to look past the math. Instead, try to concentrate on how we choose our steps to reach our goal. Remember that there's many ways to get to our goals in statistics. So what I show you today, it's just a tiny little example of one way to go about things. I am anticipating uh, a few more questions today than usual. So the presentation is going to last about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll take some time at the end of the presentation to answer some questions from our audience. I have currently muted the line, so only my voice can be heard, but one of our awesome statisticians, Brianna Ramirez, is monitoring the chat board, so feel free to type any questions you have on the chat board. Brianna will choose some to ask me at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical issues, I often find that logging out, just logging out and back into the webinar clears up just about everything. So when in doubt, reboot. Um, you can also type a question to Brianna in the little chat area if you if you have problems and she'll try to help you. Okay, so let's make sure I get this to work today. Yay, things are going very well. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, it's a good sign. Before I begin, I want to take a minute or, or so to tell you about Omega Statistics and the Stats for the Masses webinars and newsletters. Statistics can be difficult, even for seasoned researchers. Often textbooks, classes, training programs, they can make things a little more confusing. I'm hoping we don't do that because my goal with the Stats for the Masses series and for Omega Statistics as a company is to inform and educate about statistical concepts in layman's terms whenever possible. Sometimes that isn't easy. We do try to do our best so that everyone can see the elegance and usefulness of statistics. Here are some information about us as a company. Those of you who've been with us before have seen this slide before, so I won't go over it too much today. I do want to tell you about our next webinar. It's in the back. It, uh, the, I think we have four of them in this series. This is the first. The next one is in February. Then we'll have one in March, one in April. But on February 17th, the third Wednesday in February, same time, it's going to be research questions, hypotheses, and inference. Invitations are going to be delivered in the next week or so. And the webinars are always free and recorded. So if you can't make it live to the meeting, the live meeting, you can view the webinar later at your convenience. We do have a total of four webinars as I said, and we'll end with one of our audience favorites in April, and that's the one on power analysis and determining sample size. But all four as a whole are a great overview of statistics in general, so I hope you register for the entire set. Okay, so I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, the big question today is why statistics? Why do we need to do this? You know, why bang our heads against the wall trying to learn all this? It wasn't easy for me when I started out either. So it, it is a way of thinking. Hopefully, when I take you through what we're doing today, you'll kind of see how we are thinking as statisticians and researchers. The next webinar in February is going to be really good for showing you how backwards statisticians do think with the null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis. I think that'll be very telling too. So what are statistics? If you look at the dictionary, it is actually a very good de definition. It's the science that deals with the collection, analysis, and interpretation of numerical data, often using probability theory. Or it could be the data themselves. 
Okay. Statistics, uh, what I say too, or stats for the masses, is statistics is the collection of processes dealing with collecting, analyzing, interpreting data. This is exactly what they say in Webster's. But it's to make our best guesses by taking into account the uncertainty of our guesses. And yes, statistics also are the numbers themselves. And also, there are branches of statistics where you're not even really dealing with numbers per se. You're dealing with qualitative data. Maybe you're categorizing things into groups. So there are just sets of people or sets of items or objects or not even numbers. And there's also other kinds of qualitative uh, research that's not necessarily statistics, but it's where you are asking interview questions, open-ended kind of interviews, uh, focus groups, things like that. But you can code things and kind of derive some things out of the information you get by coding certain ways with numbers. So uh, it's interesting what kind of information you can turn into numbers and then turn into information again, <laughs> different types of information. Why do we need statistics? Well, there's lots of reasons why. I'm focusing today kind of on the old school way of approaching statistics. Big data has been around for a while now. It's getting bigger and bigger. A lot of the theories and concepts that we use in statistics apply to limited samples or smaller sets of samples and such. When you have the big data, you basically have populations in themselves and things that we're going to learn today, like confidence intervals, standard errors, uh, things like that, uh, margins of error, thing like that. Things like that aren't going to be as important in big data. But if you can't pull big, giant files of data sets with millions of records, then you still need your statistics. And the main reason we need statistics is to make our best guess while measuring the amount of difference in something. In statistics speak, you'll hear words like variability or variance, uncertain, it should be uncertainty, not uncertainly, <laughs> error, noise, all these terms and others are interchangeable. And uh, often in research, we want to know the truth about something, but we don't know the truth. And statistics are used to make our best guess of the truth without having all of the information. Some examples of why we need to make really good guesses. I mean, there's any number of reasons, but I'm going to show two right now, and then we're going to work through one. The first example, and this is the one we're going to be working through, is that I perfected a new type of light bulb, and I have a lot of 20,000 bulbs. I'm not sure how long, on average, my light bulbs will last. I'd like to know. Maybe I want to use that as a selling point. On average, our light bulbs last way longer than the competition, or we just want to know. Without statistics, I would have to burn out all of my light bulbs to find out the average life of all of them. I'd know the true average life, of course, because I would have burned out all 20,000 bulbs, but then I'd have no light bulbs left. So what good would that do me? So um, in a way, I'd still be in the dark. I'd be enlightened by the mean, but still be in the dark because I'd have no lights. So with statistics, I can take a random sample of my lot of light bulbs and make a good guess at the true average bulb life. And then I can sell the rest of them. So if I use statistics, I don't have to destroy everything to find out the truth. I can, if I take a random sample, and we'll cover that a little bit later, a random sample is representative of this 20,000. So if I can get something that's random and representative, I don't have to pull so many, and I only have to destroy some to get the information I need. I like to use this one a lot when I'm explaining concepts. It seems to me there's not as many redheaded people around town. I see quite a few blondes, lots of brunettes, and I want to know if there's a difference in the proportions of people with each of the three hair colors. Well, without statistics, I'd need to check the head of every single person in town to get the true proportions. With statistics, I could take a random sample from maybe a list of citizens, some kind of roster, some kind of uh, list that represents the population, and check each person's hair color in that sample that I pull and then make a good guess. And I'd save quite a bit of time and expense, of course, because I wouldn't have to go and look at everybody in town. Some useful concepts and terminology. I always say statistics are guesses at the truth. We usually don't know the truth. Often in statistics books, you'll see problems with a true population mean or a population proportion or a population variance. You'll see something with population mentioned. Population is the complete total collection of every possible item, person, unit, outcome, whatever it is we're investigating. It's the collection of everything, every available person that would be in the population, or if it's the light bulbs, if I only have 20,000 light bulbs and that's all I have, that's my population. 
If I was looking in town for the redheads, the town would be my population. If I was looking in my neighborhood, the neighborhood would be my population. So you really need to define your population. But the population is the bigger thing that you're pulling the information from. A parameter is that unknown value we're trying to estimate. So, uh, for instance, with the light bulbs, I want to know the average time it takes for them to burn out on average. And so that would be my parameter. It's there. It's in the population. But I don't know what it is. That's what I'm trying to guess at. So the parameters could be any number of things depending on what you're looking at and what kind of test you're doing. And when we get more into the hypothesis testing and such, we'll, we'll cover this a little bit more. But it could be a mean. It could be the proportion. It could be the true variability in the data. And so if we knew these things, if we knew the parameters, then we wouldn't need these things. <laughs> we wouldn't need a sample. We wouldn't need a statistic and we wouldn't need a confidence interval um, because these all have to do with the guessing. Okay, so a sample... It's a subset of the population. We're going to use the sample we collect to make our good guess at that unknown parameter, right? So the statistic is the, our guess of the parameter, which is the unknown. There it is. This, this is our good guess. And sometimes we call the statistic our poignance estimate, and usually it is one single number. However, we can't be that accurate because we're guessing. So there's, there's really... It, there, it might happen sometimes, but very rarely are you going to guess exactly what that population parameter is. You're going to be close if you pull your sample right, if you pull a big enough sample, if you do the right test. If you, There's so many things involved, but if you do everything right, you'll get close. But you'll highly, highly unlikely you'll hit it right on the head. So that's why we need a confidence interval. So since we're making our best guess, which is an estimate, we have to allow for some leeway in our guessing. So we need to allow for variability or the error, and that's where this comes in. Actually, statistics is more about measuring the error and taking into account the error or the variability in our data than it really is about actually finding that value, at least the statisticians. If you're a researcher, you're going to, I want to know the mean and I want to know the p-value associated, and that's all you want to know. <laughs> But as a statistician, I want to take into account not only how accurate are we going to be, but how precise are we going to be. And that's another thing that the confidence interval will show us. Depending on the size of the confidence interval, it'll be how precise we are with our measurement. We build that confidence interval around our instrument, our, our instrument, our estimate, to say we're pretty darn confident that the true value that we're guessing at, that parameter that we're guessing at with our statistic, is in the range of numbers in that confidence interval. And it's tied to the level of confidence we're allowing. A lot of times we'll say we want to know with 95% confidence, or we want to, our level of confidence might be 90%, and then we're going to allow ourselves a little more leeway. Confidence interval, if you have a 95% confidence interval, what you're saying is that 95% of the time with repeated testing, if I was to go out and do my study all over again, pull the data the same way and such, that 95% of the time, the true mean or the true variance or the true whatever estimate we're looking at would be inside that interval. That gives us 5% of the time we could be wrong. We could pull, we could just by chance pull a sample that's not representative. Even though we're trying everything we can to do it, it still happens because it's a guess and there's a lot of variability in things, some more than others, but it's always there. So here's a little diagram I made. So if you have a population, then the, the parameter is what matters, and then that's the truth. It's, it's one number, and that's usually all we need. If we have this, we don't need statistics. If I knew what the true mean was, I won't have to guess at it. If I knew what the true variance was, I wouldn't have to guess at it. If I, if I knew how well something predicted something else, I wouldn't have to guess at it. So, but the sample, it's, it's a little piece of the population. Then we have our statistic that we're going to build using that information to try to guess at that parameter. It's a very good guess. We could be wrong. We probably are. So we add a confidence interval as a cushion to help us. So here's some more uh, concepts and uh, terminology. Oh, this is very interesting. I think I've mentioned this before in webinars. I, I talk about this sometimes with our clients. But when you're going through your statistics texts and books and such, you'll see all of this Greek and number or not even numbers or letters and there's no numbers. <laughs> I mean, it gets to the point now with some of the things I do, there's no numbers. Of course, whenever I use actual data, there is. But in, in theory, the higher up you get, the less numbers you seem to see. 
a good thing to know, and most of the time this is true, there are some exceptions. Parameters, which are the population things, the unknown, they're usually represented by Greek notation. Okay. Statistics are represented are, are represented by the Latin notation. So our regular old alphabet, A, B, C, D, things like that. Anytime you have a statistic, it'll usually be that kind of letter. If it's a parameter, it's usually Greek. So when you're looking at your formulas and your statistics classes, you usually if you see a letter, a regular letter, like alphabet letter, that means that you can probably find there's some kind of number that you need to be plugging in there. If you see Greek, most of the time you're not even going to bother looking for a number because it's just the unknown. Okay, so um, it's representing a parameter. So we'll look at that a little bit with some simple formulas. One of the top 10 reasons for becoming a statistician is I always wanted to learn the entire Greek alphabet. So that's on our website too, I think. You know, here's some, here are some of the uh, notations. Here's the standard deviation of the sample data. So it's an S. Here's the standard deviation of population data, so it's it's guy here, <laughs> sigma. <laughs> Takes me a while, <laughs> but that's sigma, and that's Greek. And then here's the variance, okay, and again, there's the Latin, there's the Greek. A range usually has actual numbers, so you're going to have the R. K is actually how many cases, how many participants, how many, um, something like that, and it says multipurpose, so that usually you'll have a number. Over here, you have your little observations, and these usually all come from the data, and your mean in your sample is going to be X bar. Sometimes you might just see X. Sometimes you might see some of these things. Mu, which is Greek, represents your population mean. So as you can see, most of the time it's like that. But here, n is the population size, and n little n is the sample size. And those are kind of interchangeable depending on the kind of study you're doing. Most textbooks will keep it this way, though, where n is, is this and, and little n is, is the sample. So that's not Greek, but usually you have an idea how big your population is so you can plug a number in. Because you have to know how big the population is in a way to know how big of a sample you're going to need and you know how much of it you've covered and how much of it you've looked at. So it's, it's kind of a good idea. And, and if you have to give everybody for, uh, say, a random sample, if you have to give everything that's in that population equal consideration to pull your random sample, then you kind of need to know how big your population is so you can do that. Many courses in statistics begin with an extensive training in probability theory. <laughs> and then they present the theory in mathematics using the parameter notation, the true values that we never really know unless the instructor tells us what it is or the book says, oh, by the way, the standard deviation in the population is 0.3. Well, you wouldn't know that if they didn't tell you that or if a researcher didn't tell you that. So no wonder why you get confused. By the time you get to actually working with the data or actually working some problems and being told that you'll never know a parameter and then be given a value of a parameter, it gets very confusing. Probability and theory is very important, very, very, very important. But math is also important. But statistics isn't really math, but math is the tool we use. Of course, now I'll show you all these things with math in it, and you'll go, right, Elaine, but, uh, but it is true. We need to use math as a tool. However, there are a lot of statisticians that are psychology majors that hate math, so <laughs> it does happen. So let's look at statistics and application. And with the approach that we're guessing something we don't know, that's, that's our whole approach is we don't know, we're going to find out. All right, so let's use the average light bulb life. I perfected a new type of light bulb. I have a lot, a lot of them. I have a lot of 20,000 bulbs, which is a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure how long on average they're going to last, but I'd like to know. So that's my question. That's my problem. So here's things I want to think about, right? When you're first putting this together, you're like, what do I know? What do I want to know? which is the mean light bulb life. But what do I know already? Well, I know the population is 20,000 light bulbs. So there's my N, N equals 20,000. I want to know the average life of a bulb, that's all. So I need to guess the parameter of the mean, which is mu, by using a sample to find the X bar. And I didn't have a little notation for the X bar here, so I just call it X bar when I write it out. Hopefully that's not confusing, but that's your X bar. That's what X, because it has an X and it wears a little hat. Well, no, there is X hat, but this is X bar. <laughs> We're only going to worry about X bar today. I can find a formula for computing the mean using the data I get from my sample. So here's the formula for the mean. So 
what I like to do is whenever I start getting these formulas, I kind of look to see what's possible to get and what I have already. So I see I need to fill in some blanks. Well, I don't know X bar. That's what I'm guessing at. If you have one formula, you're allowed to have one unknown. So I need to kind of figure out what this other stuff is to figure that unknown. So I need to get a sample of a specific size, which I don't know yet. And I need to sum up all of the items in the sample and divide by the sample size. So it's basically an average. This is what this is saying is you take everything, all your, all your little burnout times for each light bulb, add them all up, and divide it by the number of light bulbs you burned out, just like a regular average. So now my first question is, well, gee, now I need to get the N so I can get those Xs so I can add them up and divide by the N. So what do I do? I need to get a sample of light bulbs. And how many do I need? I want the smallest number because I want to make my best guess, but I want to sell the remaining bulbs. So I don't, you know, I don't want to overdo it. There's no reason why waste light bulbs. So I need to decide how confident I want to be in my guess. Again, I'm going to make a note here that there's many details I'm not including today. However, over the next three webinars, we'll be exploring more of these kind of things, like how confident I want to be, things like that. But for now, we're going to keep it fairly straightforward. I copied and pasted this information in, but uh, how big of a sample should I get? And this is a very easy formula. There are so many different kinds of formulas and so many different kinds of softwares and so many, so many different ways of looking at it. But again, today we're just, I'm not going to cover all those technical parts with you. I just kind of want to take you through the thinking process. Basically what we're doing is we're looking at what we have, what we need to get, and how do we figure that, right? So here's the formula we're going to use today. For 95% confidence that the sample mean is within a distance, which we're going to call M, of the true mean, then we're going to choose a sample size equal to this. This will be our sample size, our little n, and 4 is just a number. So we need to know this variance here, right? There's a sigma. That means that's a population thing. And in mean, we're going to give an idea of not the mean. This is the margin of error. It looks like a mean, but it's the margin of error. Actually, the researcher or ourselves, we can determine what we want to be as our margin of error. So, like I said, I see something Greek in that formula. And that's a population variance. So we don't know that. So we can do two things to find that population variance. And this is where it kind of falls apart for a student because they go, I'm not supposed to know that. It's an unknown thing. It's in the population. But we have to guess it. Well, to do that, we could take a pilot sample. So out of those 20,000 bulbs, we could take, you know, a small sample, maybe 25 or so, and check and see what the mean and variance are with that little sample and use that. And, and, and kind of just use that as a as kind of a, a touch point. We also could use information that we might already have. Maybe we have the information on record. Maybe somebody did a similar test on similar light bulbs. Probably not if it's a brand new light bulb of a whole different kind. Might not be any information out there. Might be something similar though. So you might want to look up some documentation on some similar things. A lot of times with me, I will ask a researcher, what is the variability? What is the percent difference you want to see? What are you allowing here for your, for your study? You know, what would be to you a difference that matters or a number that matters? And they usually can tell me and then I'll use that. So we need our margin of error here. So I can set the margin of error myself. Okay, it's the amount I'm allowing for my estimate of the average bulb life to deviate from the true mean. So uh, my statistic will be what I figure, and I, it's like how much am I allowing to be wrong? For my guess of the average light bulb life, I'm allowing myself some leeway of six hours. So I can go in either direction. I can be six hours too low or six hours too high because I'm going to measure the bulb life in hours. So I figure, okay, I'm going to allow my six hour, myself six hours either way. That's actually a very, very small margin of error. Light bulbs last a long, long time, especially nowadays. So six hours either way is really nothing. And you will see after I work the numbers, some of the silliness we get. But it, it's kind of telling in itself. So I have uh, 15 minutes I'm going to allow for my margin of error. Oh, what did I say? Six hours? Wait, what did I say? Okay, so what I did was I figured it. Um, I figured 15 minutes. <laughs> so I put 0.25 hours. So I also pulled a pilot sample of 20 light bulbs, and I estimated the population variance at 12 hours. Now I have everything but one item, the N. So now i got to get that. But I have all the numbers I need. So in math class, you probably have heard this if you've taken math class, where you just plug and chug, especially with like an algebra problem. You just 
find everything you do have and then you plug it in there and you chug away to get the answer. So here's our numbers. So we have our N, we have the four, which comes right there. I said the variance was 12 and here's our margin of error is going to be a 0.25, but we're going to square that. And so here it is. And I squared that. So I'm dividing. So the variance was already squared. Sometimes you'll look at that and go, well, my variance was 12, but O2 or, or sigma squared, sorry, O2, sigma squared is your variance. It, it is already squared. It's already that. So I'm not going to say 12 squared because I said my variance, which is sigma squared, is 12. So when I do the math, I need a lot of light bulb. Maybe I want to adjust my margin of error because I don't want to take a thousand. I don't want to take that many out and test them or, you know, 768. So I'm going to allow more leeway in my margin of error. So uh, that's what I did. Now I'm going to make it point a half an hour, 30 minutes, either way. Still very, very small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, margin of error but when I put in the information now I get a sample size of 192 which is much better I'm willing to get rid of that many light bulbs I'm fine with that so as you can see right up front you might need to make some leeways because a lot of times statistics is about time and money how much time do I have to collect all this data to burn out all these light bulbs how much is it going to cost me to collect all this data and burn out all these light bulbs especially if you're doing a study where you're surveying people or something like that how long is it going to take you to, to collect information on 300 people you'd be surprised maybe you don't even have 300 people so you have to adjust down so you have to make some concessions until you can get something that's workable and, and it's still a study worth doing. So yippee, I have my sample size. So I'm happy. That's a big deal because now I can pull that and I can get that information and I can do the math. And so I'm just, so what I said here is now I'm just going to go out and uh, I'm going to track the time. I'm going to find my estimate. So I'm just going to go and grab 192 bulbs out of that 20,000. But you need to wait. For instance, if I was to go and take a sample and it wasn't random, I might not get a representative sample. Representative means you want all things to kind of be like the population would be. Light bulbs probably aren't an example I could use, but say you're using people. You would want to pull a random sample, say from a population in town. I would want to make sure, let's say if we're doing the, the redhead versus the blonde versus the brunette, I don't want to go to the Scottish festival and pick out my sample. Because everybody there's going to be a redhead. Well, not everybody, but there's going to be quite a few more redheads, right? I also don't want to go to, uh, you know, nor, uh, a, a place maybe where there might be a lot of people with very light hair. Because I'm going to get, it's not going to be representative. So I could go out and go, okay, I need 200 people for my study. I'm going to go to the Scottish Festival. Wow, you know, I had like, you know, 20% of the people or 25% are redheads. No, that's not going to work. So for this one... When you think about the light bulbs, it's always best to pull a random sample. See, if those defective bulbs were in boxes on a pallet in front of the other bulbs, and I just pulled 192 bulbs out of the defective ones, then I'd probably get all defective bulbs, and my estimate of the average bulb life would be very, very wrong. And I might not be able to see that they're defective. The box itself might, you know, there might be a box or two that are defective. We don't even know it yet. So all these things are unknown in that population in a lot of ways. So we want to be able to control for that upfront as much as possible. So there's many ways to pull a random sample. We're going to pull a simple random sample. There's people have their whole careers on sampling. So we certainly can't cover it in a few minutes. But in a simple, a simple random sample, each light bulb in the population of 20,000 bulbs will have an equal chance of being selected. And we're going to pull them without replacement, which means once they're pulled, we can't put them back in because we're going to pull them and then we're going to burn them until they burn out. So you can't replace them anyway. Sometimes you can pull samples with replacement and that's where your probability theory comes in and goes to work. But, you know, just thinking of it in a common sense way, you know, you're not going to be replacing them. So we can't replace them. There's so many ways to pull it but we're going to pull it simple. Let's pretend that the 20,000 bulbs are all numbered 
from 1 to 20,000. And they're all going to have an equal chance of being selected. So they're all going to have an equal chance of 1 in 20,000, at least at first when you pull the first one, right? And then you're going to pull the second one. So, of course, the conditional probability is going to go down because you're going to have one less every time you pull a bulb. So after you pull one, then you're only going to have 19,999 to pull from the 19,998, so on and so on and so on. However, at each time, you have an equal equal way of doing this, uh, equal chance. So in theory, what I could do is I could write individual numbers on 20,000 pieces of paper and put all the pieces of paper in a very big hat, stir them up, pull 192 pieces of paper. Then I'd go find the bulbs that match the numbers chosen. That's very old school. And you have to remember, statistics were actually developed during a time when you didn't have big data and computers and such. So pulling 192 bulbs was probably a pretty big sample. It still is, but it's much easier to get a sample, a random sample, and find what your number's going to be for that sample or what items you need to pull when you use software. So we don't have any hat tricks today. There are any number of softwares that are going to generate your random numbers. I can use R and some code, and R is free. You can download it, and you can use it, and it's great. You can write your own programs. I use R as a backup. In fact, all of us do here when one of the softwares, like SPSS, SAS, or something, does not have what we already something that we need. So we'll build our own programs. But I'll show you how to do this. What I did was I put that code into this notepad file. So this is the name of my sample that I'm pulling. So it's just a name I give it. I could call it data sample. I'm calling it random192. And then the function or the code is you say sample. And then I want, it, uh, I want numbers randomly pulled between 1 and 20,000. And I want 192 of them. And I'm not going to replace them. This is without replacement. And then it's, I'm going to ask it to pull it up. And it's going to give me the numbers, and then I'm going to ask it to sort. So at the end, we'll have them all nicely sorted. So let me go ahead and copy that. I'm going to put it in R. And this is much better than writing numbers and putting them in a hat. There you go. Here's all my sample. Okay, and as you can see, they're all randomly drawn. There should be 192 numbers there. So here's 1 through 12. This one starts at 13. So this one's at, and it goes down and down at 181. So it should end at 192 on this end if you count over. But they're all out of order. So what I can do is just sort with this uh, command right here. Now they're all in order from smallest to largest. And I'm sure you can sort descending the other way, you know, from biggest to smallest. But we won't do that today. But R is great. So there you go. We have that. So let me go back to my slide. You can use Excel. There's a RAND function, but boy, is it a lot of work, especially when you want to do the sorting and you want to pull 192. There's much, much better ways of doing it. And there's other softwares that'll do it for you too. But ours great, easy. And of course, you can get as involved as you want to be with how you want to sample it. Okay. And it also looks like here's a uh, website you can go to that tells you how to use the Excel. And um, if you go there, you'll see what I mean. It's very involved. This is much easier. <laughs> okay, so now I have my 192 random numbers. I picked the light bulbs. I matched them to the numbers. Now these are called my units of measurement, right, because I'm taking my measurement on the light bulbs. And my measurement is how long it takes in hours for them to burn out. But the units are the light bulbs themselves. So I plug in the light bulbs, I burned them all out, I noted the time it took for each of them to burn out in hours, and now I have a sample size of 192 burnout times. Okay, that sounded simple, but in real time is hard work. As I said, in the real world, there are probably machines that will accelerate the burnout times, probably a place you can put all the uh, bulbs in and it just, you know, I'm not really sure. But the machines also have all been tested using statistics to meet certain criteria and specifications because we want, we want to make sure they're measuring those times right. Right. So that's uh, compliance testing. It's also called quality control and see statistics are everywhere. So everything, every tool, Every measurement instrument, every little thing you use, you want to make sure you calibrate it. You know, you want to make sure that if you're using a survey that it's been tried and true and it's been tested. And there's statistics for that. There's statistics to calibrate your measurement to make sure that you're getting uh, the right fill on the bottles or the right uh, burnout times on the light bulbs. There's a lot of different statistics. So now I can use my formula to find the average time and allow for my 30-minute margin of error. So um, here's my mean formula. 
I have everything but the X bar. So what I'm going to do is sum up all 192 burnout times. Then I'm going to take that number. I'm going to divide it by my N, which is 192. And ta-da, I have my mean. I have my X bar, which is an estimate of mu, which is the true parameter. But we'll never know what the true parameter is. We guessed at it, right, with X bar. So let's say I did all that and my mean was this number. And it's approximately 10 years of bulb life if I burned them constantly 24-7. I told you those were good bulbs. So now I have this mean of 87,600 hours. So I need some more things to get some precision on my estimate. And this is where we get our confidence interval. And I think I'm running over a little bit. So we'll try to get to some questions. And if we don't, we'll post them on the web page or I'll send the answers to them whenever we. Uh, send out the slides. So, oh boy, now I need to know some other things. I need to get the, the standard deviation because I'm going to figure out my confidence interval. So I have two formulas here. Here we go. All the Greek. Okay, I'm looking at this formula going, well, you know, there's probably not much I can do with this one. Okay, I can't use it. But down here, I can use this. Look, there's no Greek in there. So that means somehow I should be able to find numbers to put in here. Now, you'll see this SD. Sometimes you'll just see S. You know, so um, notation changes too, which is another confusing thing. We might have five ways of writing the same thing. The best thing to do is whenever you're reading your textbook is to find out how they're defining the terms. Try When you look at these formulas, just make sure you know what every one of these little unknowns is supposed to mean, and that'll help you with it. You'll see X bar, sometimes you'll see X hat, sometimes. So you just need to kind of know from reading the text how the authors are doing this. So here's the sample standard deviation. And I can use this. Oh, and I, yes, I wanted to say this too. Nowadays, you don't have to do any of these calculations by hand. I mean, in, in a blink of an eye, and I'm serious, I could have those numbers in there, hit one or two buttons, and it'll come up. Okay, with my mean, my standard deviation, it'll even give me my confidence interval. It'll give me everything I want in my software. But I do need to kind of know what's going on behind the scenes a little bit so I know the numbers I'm getting are making sense. Garbage in, garbage out. And you'll be amazed at the garbage you put in. What you get out looks good, but when you look at it in detail, you go, oh, something happened. So, and that just takes time, a time and practice. But uh, for the sake of saving time, let's assume my standard deviation was 16 hours. That's pretty darn good, especially whenever the mean was eight. 87,600. So it's almost impossible to know that your standard deviation, that all those light bulbs are kind of burning out in that close of an amount of time. I would expect my standard deviation to be a lot bigger and my variability to be a lot bigger. We're just going to say this for the sake of argument. So to the right is yet another formula. And this one's for the confidence interval because we have our guess at 87,600 hours. But how much around it? Am I going to look to say that the true means probably we're pretty confident, 95% confident that the real mean is inside this interval because it's certainly not going to be 87,600 hours. It could be, but probably it's not going to be that specific number, right? So here I have everything except for this. I don't have this. And I can get this from a table. And I can get this from the R program. I can get this from a lot of things. And in later webinars, we're going to look more closely at how to find that value. But this is your T statistic for a two-sided confidence interval. So for now, I can tell you that the value we want is 1.96. <laughs> and so we have everything we need. So here we go, because there's our X bar, which is the 87,600. Here's this, which is 1.96. I think I said our standard deviation was 16. And N was 192. So we have everything we need. So we now we do the math. So here it is with the plug and chug. And here's our confidence interval. What we're going to do here is we're going to take that mean and we're going to take this information on the other side here and we're going to add it to one side of the mean. We're going to subtract it from the mean too. So our confidence interval is going to be 87,600 hours plus or minus 2.24 hours. So it's, we're so precise here. It's amazing, right? It's ridiculously amazing. You would never see this in the real world. But according to the math I did, the 95% confidence interval, interval for the estimate of the true average burnout time, estimate of the true average burnout time in hours for the population of 20,000 light bulbs is this. It's as low as this or it can be as high as this. Very precise. 
Like I said, you will never see something like you might see something like that in the real world, but you'd have to have some a really, really big sample. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's it's it's pretty funny. So some things to consider. We want our statistics to be accurate and precise. You want to be right on with that 87,600, but that's just the number. If my confidence interval went from 50 to 150,000, then that would mean that that true mean could be anywhere inside that interval. It would be so huge, you wouldn't be precise at all, right? Because it could be just any number, basically, then. Of course, now my confidence interval being that tight, that's kind of suspicious as, wow, how did you get that close, you know? So they give us a level of precision, this confidence interval, and our margin of error. I set the margin of error really kind of small. I presented only a few ways to compute these numbers. Okay, there's many other approaches, and we're going to look into the statistics and some of these approaches in more depth in those upcoming webinars. However, we're only going to touch the surface in this series. Even, even when we look a little more in depth, I'm not going to tell you everything there is to know. It's just not possible in a matter of a few hours. So I can't say I've been practicing statistics for over 30 years. I'm still learning all the time. It is called a practice, right? It's uh, just like you're a do practicing doctor or practicing statistician. So I can't stress enough to those interested in statistics that they should actually make use of real data and play with the concepts. Real data is dirty, it's messy, it doesn't pay attention, it won't listen to you. So you learn much more by playing with the numbers, real numbers, than you would sitting at a desk running simulations or reading a textbook. It's like playing a piano. I could tell you all day what the music means, where to hit the keys on the piano, and you might you know, pass those kind of tests. Oh yes, it's this key and it's this note. But you, could you really play it? No, not if you don't play it. So you need to play. Some other things to consider. A good textbook is by my friend uh, Mario Triola. He's been at it. I've been at it 30 years. He's probably been at it about 50 years. In fact, I have a seventh edition. I think he's up to the 12th edition now on elementary statistics. But it's very nice. It's it's a very good 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 book. And here's some things that he talks about in the seventh edition as bad kind of things with statistics. Small samples. You can't generalize your finding from small samples to the general population. He gives an example of like, I think he said seven out of 10 dentists, but like four out of five dentists used to be a commercial on TV. Four out of five dentists surveyed. Well, if you only surveyed five dentists, you don't really know. It's like if I went out and I got five people from the population and, you know, three of them happened to be redheads. I couldn't really say that's true because I'm only looking at five people. I need to look at a lot more people to really be sure that I'm getting something representative. I'd also like to note, and this has to do with big data, super large samples are not good either. If you're looking for significant findings, too large of a sample will overpower a study and you'll find significance on the tiniest little things. And we're going to cover this more in the third webinar of the series, the one about the p-values and effect sizes in March. I think that's a very up-to-date kind of uh, current trending kind of thing. I think everybody should watch that one. It's very important. P-values are almost becoming unimportant. Effect sizes are what matter, especially with the big data. Precise. You can't be too precise. If I said the mean burnout time for the light bulbs was 87,600.35894 hours, we're guessing here. Your guesses should never be that precise. And bad samples. I would say here about the Fox News poll. Dr. Phil's show, things like that, they'll do a poll, and but it's of their viewers. So it's only the people that are watching their show that even care to turn on their show, let alone call in and make a vote. So it's not random. So those kind of things are not good statistics. They're not good sampling. Convenient samples also, where you're just taking volunteers into a study, where you post something on the bulletin board at school, say, hey, I'm a... Uh, I'm taking, I'm taking volunteers to take a survey. You send something out on SurveyMonkey to a bunch of volunteers. They have their place, but they're not generalizable because they're not randomly selected people. They're convenient samples. You can't give them as much credit as a random sample for the most part. Here's some references. There's Triolas. Here's another one a lot of people talk about. They love this one. Erdan, TC. I think it's Tim. Tim Erdan. And very good. Andy Fields is great. You got to go to Statistics Hell. You'll love it. He he is funny. I, sometimes it's roll your eyes kind of funny, but he is funny. And one time when I was an undergrad, I Googled, I hate statistics. And this is what came up. <laughs> Saved my life. <laughs>
And then the Stat Trek website has a great list of books right here at this at this link. All good books. And then you kind of have to pick and choose what works for you. You know, maybe I didn't even make sense to you today, and then you need to find another source. But uh, somewhere there's somebody that can explain it, and if you play with it enough, it's going to make sense. I have this kind of uh, information here. I think this is actually old information. We don't have clone anymore. We've kind of absorbed it into Omega. So, but that's fine. I can change that before I send these out. And thank you for attending. There's all our information. And my gosh, we only have about five minutes left. So I don't know, Brianna, do you have a couple questions for me? Oh, let me turn on your speaker. There you are. Hi, Elaine. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> um, we do have just a few questions. We might be able to get through all of them. Okay. Uh, the first question we got is, what is the difference between a mean, a median, and a mode? Oh, yes. Those are, those are some terms we didn't really cover too much today. A mean is an average, mathematical average. You add everything up, divide it by the number of things you added up, that's your mean. Okay, um, just like you see an average in school. A median is actually a true center, and a median is really important when you have that normal bell-shaped distribution that you see all the time in school, where they told this is a normal distribution, it's that bell shape. The median is that true center. It's right in the middle. You'll see the median. That's where it really matters a lot with that distribution, the normal distribution. We'll cover that in some of the later webinars, but it is the true center. And then a mode is basically uh, the thing you see the most in the data. And you don't see that a lot like, say, with the light bulb burnout times, but you would see it more like if you had ethnicities, for instance. You know, uh, the mode might be the number of people who are, are white, say, if it's mostly a Caucasian kind of distribution. Where else? And, and, and there are some times with numbers. Say it's a score of one to five, right? And everybody's giving their score of their rating of something. Well, the motive would be the score that the person, that the people all together scored the most. So maybe they're picking four more than in any of the other numbers. That would be your mode. It's, and sometimes you can have more than one mode. You can have, a, say they pick four, the number four or five times, and they pick the number six, five times, and every other number two or three times. Well, there you have two modes, four and six. So yeah, we'll cover those, I think, a little bit more in some of the future webinars because a lot of those are related to distributions. Okay, great. Our next question is, why can't a variance or a standard deviation be less than zero? That's a good question. It's a little... It's a little odd um, to explain. Probably the easiest way to explain it is that a variance and standard deviation, you can think of them as a distance because they're measurements of error. And so error, to, for something to be of an error, you have to have some kind of thing that it's deviating from, right? So for instance, if I had a mean, well, an error would be the distance from the mean things are, right? Well, then we're talking distance and you never have a negative distance. I could go to grandma's house and I can come back home. Well, it takes me 10, it's 10 miles to grandma's house. It's also 10 miles back home. It's not negative 10. I don't come back to zero. I go 10 miles and I go another 10 miles. So it's, it's, it's basically, it's a distance kind of measure and distances are never negative. Does that, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Can you only use statistics on normal distributions? Um, so, for instance, what if you have data that are not normal? Oh, no, you can use statistics on all kinds of distributions. And, that, and I think a lot of people think that when they take their basic stats, they keep seeing that bell-shaped curve, and they're always testing. And, and then a little bit later on, maybe in a subsequent class or two, they're, we're testing for normality. We're testing for outliers. We're testing for all these things to make sure that everything's going to fit that normal distribution. We're transforming to make it normal. There's, you can do all kinds of statistics and not need a normal distribution. In fact, the statistics that they say normal distributions are important for, you can relax that assumption so much. Variability matters more. You want, if you're comparing distributions or comparing groups of people or comparing things, that equal variance matters more than the normality even. But they make a very big deal about it. And it is important. There are things that are skewed, whereas a lot of things build up on the lower end or a lot of things build up on a higher end. But you can take that into account whenever you're running your numbers. And there are adjustments that can always be made because we're guessing. So over the years, there's been all kinds of things that have been developed because we're never going to pull the, the nice data. It's always dirty 
nasty, unruly. Yeah, so you need to have things to adjust for that. So no, there's all kinds of distributions. We'll probably go over some more in the later webinars, but no, you can use statistics on just about anything. Okay, great. And I just have one more question. I think we can fit it in. Okay, yeah. Um, we, we didn't discuss hypotheses today. Do we really need them? When you do hypothesis testing, you need them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you do. I wouldn't that be great? <laughs> we don't even need these hypotheses. I think I said in one. I think it's the next webinar. I'm going to teach you how to think backwards because everything is related to the null hypothesis, not the alternative. The alternative is what you really want to see. You know, you want to see significance, but the null is the thing that's saying there's nothing going on. There's no differences. There's nothing to see here, right? But you do need them when you hypothesis test. If you have a research question and you're doing some kind of you're wanting to make some kind of, we call it inference, you want to conclude something, you want to test something, yes, you do. Today, we just looked at deriving a mean. Well, we're not testing it against anything. Now, we could have made a hypothesis test and said, you know, we are, we are testing that the mean light bulb burnout time is more than 80,000 hours. But we went in today just saying we have no idea, so we're not comparing it to anything. But say you wanted to compare that, your light bulbs to some the best that are on the market now, and the best that were on the market now were 80,000 hours, and you wanted to see if your 87,600 hour average bulbs were better, then you'd need your hypothesis test. Yeah. And then we got one more question while you were answering that one. Do you think we have time? Um, yeah, if they have time. I have time. Okay. <laughs> so the question is, if you have a mean of 12 and a 95% confidence interval from 9 to 15, then is it equally likely, 95% likely, that the true mean is anywhere between 9 and 15? And what about the point estimate of 12? Is it just the middle point? Well, yeah, the point estimate of 12 is what you guessed at with that first math when you did your mean, when you computed it, right? The confidence interval, it's, it's, your, it's not really for any value in particular. So it's not like you're looking at that and going, okay, everything is equally distant from the 12. I can see what they're saying. They're looking at three below and three above. But if you have a mean of 12 and your confidence interval is 9 to 15, all that tells you is that inside that confidence interval, if I was to do that test over again, pull the sample the same way, collect data from the same population, that I would probably, my mean that I would get or my point estimate that I would get would be inside that interval. It would be somewhere between the 9 and the 15. But as far as the probabilities inside that confidence interval, I've never thought of it that way before. And I don't know if that's really a way to think about it. But what we're saying is that we can be not, we can be confident that if we went out and did that test again, kind of similarly, that we would our true mean would be somewhere in, inside there between a nine and a fifteen. Even though we got twelve, the true mean could be nine, ten, eleven. It could be any of those. And we could be 95% confident that if we test it again, it would be one. It would be in there. Okay, great. We got to thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I figure if I talk long enough, it'll <laughs> <laughs> make sense. Just keep talking, Elaine. It'll sink in. No, it's it is weird. Sometimes I do go on and on too because it's it it, it is sometimes it's a circular thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is that it? Are there any more? That is it for now. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I see some people came in a little bit late, but we'll get you the recording. And um, and I hope everybody go and sign up for, for next month because I think it's just going to get better and better. And if I, I, I promise if you stick out the four webinars here, you're, you're going to know you're going to know more. <laughs> you're going to know more. I think hopefully you're going to be more comfortable with it, too. The nice thing about statistics is you can play with them, and you're not going to blow anything up. Right. It's, they're just numbers and their computer system and you just back up your files a lot and you'll be fine. They're safe to play with, even though sometimes I get scared of pressing buttons. But, you know, I have to tell myself that you can do it again if you mess it up. OK, thank you, everybody, for coming and we'll see you next month. <laughs> bye bye.